Trashomaniacs. Welcome to the 60th inst- yeah, I can't even talk tonight. Welcome to the 60th installment of the Geo Gearheads. I'm Daryl W4 with the Bad Cop, and each week we talk about the geekier side of geolocation, and we have an exciting show for those of you who are geocachers on iOS, but also have some great information for uh, anyone who's really into uh, things like the live API. Before we get into that discussion on Geosphere 3, there are a few things we want to share with all of our listeners and viewers. First, our big thanks go out to those of you who, in our audience, who have made a donation through PayPal to help offset the cost of hosting these shows. Minnesota Boy and the Wooden Radio, along with an anonymous donor, sent in their donations after we mentioned the need in the last show. For a total covering just about half of that expense, I want to thank you on behalf of Daryl, the entire, entire Geo Gearheads audience, and myself. We're dedicating tonight's show to these donors. Now, to anyone who might be thinking about making a donation, we'd really appreciate the support. And there's still a couple more weeks until that big web hosting due, bill is due. You can find a PayPal link at the left side of the Cashomaniac site, or drop us an email at geogearheads at cashomaniacs.com, and we'll help you make special arrangements. Now, we're going to share the topics for the next three shows. Next week, we're talking about scuba caching. Then the following week, we're on to streaking. Three weeks from today, we're doing another one of our randomized editions, the shows where the bad cop and I talk about a bunch of little topics. And that's one of the reasons we want to share these schedules with you is for the feedback, and especially for those randomized shows. Your feedback really helps build and shape these shows, and the randomized shows are frequently entirely topics submitted by the Geo Gearheads audience. You can email us an audio comment or just type that up and send it to us at geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or call our voicemail line at 206-350-3647. We'd love to have your questions and feedback for either the scuba caching streak, well, either the scuba caching or streaking, but especially for the randomized show. That's right. Now, you can watch us record live through Google Plus Hangout on Air every Thursday night at 6.10 p.m. Pacific, 9.10 p.m. Eastern. Now, if you don't have a Google Plus account, you, can, um, you, you don't have to watch us there. We're also uh, streamed at the same time on YouTube. And uh, we set up a limited time post on the Cashamaniac site with that live stream, and it's auto-magically posted to Twitter and Facebook. So if you're not following us there, head on over to the Cashamaniac site for our links on Facebook, Google+, or Twitter feeds. Connect with us for all these postings and postings for the release of the shows coming up. Of course, you can always subscribe to the feed through the favorite podcatcher for the audio version and watch the live recording on YouTube anytime you like. Indeed. And with that, let's get our guest on for tonight, uh, for tonight who's uh, the developer of Geosphere 3. Welcome to the show, Mark. My pleasure. Glad to be here. And for anyone who uh, is looking for a, a primer on Geosphere, you might want to go check out the geocaching podcast that we did with uh, Mark a few weeks ago. And we'll link to that in the show notes as well. But tonight we have you on to talk really about uh, ways to make the most of uh, Geosphere without getting uh, too in-depth, because that's kind of tough on a uh, podcast. But why don't we start with the most obvious uh, one, which is working with uh, pocket queries. And this has changed quite a bit from the previous version to version 3. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, version 2, the previous one, you're limited entirely to the GPX format that geocaching.com provided. Um, and what's new with version 3 is the access to the GC Live. Now, tell us, what, uh, what advantage does the GC Live API uh, have for us? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, the first is more information. So there are some fields that are simply not uh, available in the GPX format. For example, uh, favorites. 
uh, how many favorite points a cash has earned, um, as well as whether you favorited a cash, um, whether it's a premium cash, uh, that kind of thing. Um, a couple others would be images. Um, in the GPX format, there was no explicit reference to any image that, that belongs to the cache. And with GC Live, um, actual list of images is included. So those are, those are a handful of things. I might also add that um, uh, when you create the pocket query, there's a difference. Um, when you're doing a GPX format, the day you run the pocket query is exactly when uh, the data all is made at that time. Whereas with GC Live, the only thing that happens on the day you run the pocket query is the list of caches is created. Now, when you actually import a GC Live pocket query, um, you're getting current data, data that's uh, as of that moment in time. And that's one of the things that uh, uh, really took me kind of by surprise when I started working with it uh, was the difference in the information that you got between the pocket query and the uh, uh, live version of that pocket query because it does change. And it does take a little bit longer to actually process that, as I recall. Um, it does. Most of that time is actually the downloading um, because for every small group of caches, there needs to be another access into uh, the geocaching.com servers, whereas with the GPX format, it's just sort of like one, one operation. Please give me this large file. Um, and they have to, of course, query their database in real time. So getting the information takes longer. Uh, the importing is really negligibly longer. Um, the iPod, um, sorry, the iPhone is um, incredibly powerful. <laughs> Indeed it is, but if you do have a, a slower uh, connection, it might be better off to do the, uh, we'll call it the uh, prepared version of the uh, GPX file, or the pocket query, rather than going through the live API, which is going to take a little bit uh, longer, especially on a slow connection. Right, and, and with the most recent version of Geosphere, you get the choice of which one to load. Which is very, very nice and does help yes, quite is. a bit. But one of the uh, questions that I've heard asked a few times about the uh, live API, because it does have those limits on queries, becomes if you are downloading the uh, information right from the database through those uh, pocket queries, does it count against your total uh, cache hits, you know, your live limits for the day? Right, good question, because as a premium uh, member, you're allowed uh, 10,000 downloads a day, and the good news is when you do it via the GC Live, um, the pocket query in particular, that does not count against your daily limits. Very, very good. And we mentioned uh, that the new version does actually allow you to uh, run the uh, pocket query from the browser as well, so can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, right. So uh, one of the, the issues is that the GC Live interface does not directly allow um, an app to run a pocket query, to create a pocket query. Uh, you have to do that on their website. So um, when you're looking at your list of pocket queries, or the, uh, on the upper right is what we call the action button. When you press that, you get an option to, uh, to show in, in the browser your pocket queries. And then you can use that to... Uh, the little browser built into Geosphere to select your pocket query and say run it, um, or you can create a brand new one if you'd like. But that's how you can initiate it, and then once it's generated, then you can go back to using the normal GC Live to access it. Well, and one of the great things about that is something I just did this morning, though I had a computer handy when I did it, so I didn't really have to do it through the browser, but I've done it before, is I have a, a pocket query set up that I don't run ever, unless I absolutely uh, know that I should run it, which is, show me all of the unfound caches in my area. Well, I had a bunch of caches that published right about the time I was leaving to the office this morning, so I ran that uh, pocket query so that I get all of those new caches. As I'm walking out the door, I downloaded it into a Geosphere, and sure enough, there were two uh, that I could attempt on my way to the office this morning. So it's one of those uh, great little things where you can set up those essentially... Uh, prefabricated uh, specialty queries, whether it's you know oldest caches, that kind of stuff, run it from the browser and then just import it right into uh, Geosphere and run. 
Exactly. And then, of course, there's the, you know, you're talking about a brand new cash publish. There's also the cases where cash is get archived since you generated the pocket query. And you're able to import it again via GC Live and pick up all that and all those changes. So you'll know, oh, that one's been disabled. Don't go for that one. Right. Now, but if you're uh, doing just the active caches, you might not get that information. But one of the uh, things that the Live does allow you to do is get updates on the existing groups, if I recall. Yeah, you can get what's called, like uh, they call it a status update, which is uh, availability, and it does include a few other things, if the cache type has changed and if it's toggled between a premium or not. But for the most part, people would use that for just, is it available? Um, so if you go over to the groups task, you can select a group and uh, look at the update options, and in there, you would get the choice to either do uh, a basic cache update. That's, of course, basic members would, would only have that option. Um, full is if you want the logs, basically. And the, the last choice you get is cache status. Um, that one's very fast. It can do uh, an update of 3,000 uh, caches in uh, a matter of seconds. Well, that's just looking for the change in status. So that's just very little data it's pulling. It's very little data, but it's helpful if you're about to go out and you want to make sure nothing has mm -hmm. changed its availability. Right. Yeah, very, very good if you're uh, collecting all that information. And one of the advantages of keeping the information in there and just updating uh, the information periodically through those new pocket queries is that you'll be able to get uh, more information, especially because you can have the option then to accumulate more logs than a pocket query really allows. Right. You, as with any import into Geosphere, you have the option to, to accumulate more and more logs. So you don't need to rely on an online connection if, you, if that's your habit, is to collect logs. Yeah, yeah. And that can be really handy for things like uh, uh, you know, the more difficult hides, whether they're puzzle caches or higher difficulty terrain. Mm -hmm. But what we've been talking about right now is just the stuff that's been published to geocaching.com and available on geocaching.com. But to me, one of the big advantages to the third-party apps is you don't have to have caches that are published on geocaching.com, which especially comes in handy for things like events. Most of the events that we do around here don't have uh, the caches published, but they'll have caches spe uh, you know, specifically for the event that they've done and they'll give you that uh, uh, GPX file to load in. But one of the catches with those, you, know, you can email those or you know, grab them from a website and bring it in through uh, Geosphere, which really does a good job, and we've talked about how to do that uh, a couple times on the show before. But you can't actually go and upload those field notes, and that's something that uh, you want to be aware of uh, through the API because the API is going to respond that those caches don't exist. Well, and indeed they don't exist uh, from a published perspective. So uh, you're right. You can use them for event uh, caches. You can you can still create a field note, yes, but you just can't, of course, upload them. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the way that I deal with that is I still go through and do the old-fashioned export, which is a great feature that I'm happy to see stayed because some of the uh, apps, when they went live API, stripped out that ability. But what the export does is give you that old-fashioned uh, uh, field notes text file that you can manually upload. And even better yet, if you're out caching with a group of people, pass it around. Right. Good point. And I might also add there are uh, pretty much anything you could do in version 2 is still retained in version 3, all those web uh, uploading field notes via the web or importing via the web. All that stuff still works. It's just now in the background as, uh, as it's... G GC Live kind of takes over more so. Nice, nice. Now, also, you can work with more uh, GC.com lists. Uh, yes. Um, so similar to the pocket queries, you, you know, on, on GC.com, you can have lists, and uh, you can see your lists um, uh, right next to pocket queries if you're in the um, online profile task, uh, and just as easily import them. Um, as a pocket query. Now, these will count against your daily limit, uh, but typically these lists are not uh, very large in my observation. Um, and, but uh, kind of a variant that's really handy is you can look up other people's profiles, and if they've made a list public, 
um, in the same manner, you can import their list. I know around here, uh, someone maintains interesting night caches. So it's easy for me to look them up and then go down to their profile and look on lists, and there, there is their list I can just import immediately into a, in my own group. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I find this uh, really handy because I do a lot of lists for things like trips, any of the uh, puzzles that I solve to go into those uh, bookmark lists, and I had to create the pocket query and then run the pocket query. So now I bypass the whole pocket query and I just pull it uh, live whenever I need it. And that's one of the things uh, Bad Cop, you and I have talked about several times is when you go on those uh, caching trips, it's really handy to build a pocket list or a bookmark list of mm -hmm. the ones that look like they're going to be good targets. Exactly. Cherry pick those and we can then through uh, Geosphere we can download those just the ones we want. Yeah, and if you'd like them to stand out, it's also easy to import them into their own group, and then you can select the entire group and say, highlight this group. So all those caches will then, um, you know, appear, kind of stand out, they'll stand out more as you're, as you're nearing them. Yeah, and we'll probably want to get into that highlight functionality a little later, because that is a great function and one of the uh, best reasons that I have for using uh, uh, Geosphere over any of the other ones. But what are some of the other uh, um, things that we're going to want to do? Especially, I'm thinking like uh, preloading images when we go off the grid is one of those big things. And we've had the option to preload the images before, but it does change a little bit in the uh, current version. Um, in, indeed, it does. Um, first, let me explain that uh, whether you use the GC Live or the GPX format, neither format actually contains the image itself. It's, they're, they're merely just URLs or pointers to images out on the web. So Geosphere will always take whatever images are provided to it and include them in the image list. But what preloading is about is actually loading the image onto your device so you don't need to use the Internet uh, when you're out in the field, either because it's spotty reception or you have a device with no Internet. So. Um, uh, now, what's different from, from version 2 is, uh, well, let me take the, the images and put them in categories, if you will. Um, there are Part of the image gallery online are images that the owner of the cache has uploaded, um, some of which may, may appear in the description of the cache. And there's also images that users have uploaded as part of their log. So you have cache images and log images. Um, and on top of that, they, the owner may have put references to other images in the description that uh, they didn't upload to geocaching.com. So Geosphere will take all those different types of images and include them in its image gallery. And for preloading, give you the option of whether you want to load just the cache images, all the images, or of course, none of the images if you'd, if you'd rather images just come in as you view them. Does that make sense? It does. Now, which one, which set of images can we get through uh, GC Live? Yeah, GC Live will give you the ones that are in the image gallery of geocaching.com. So that would be the cache images and the log images. little caution or footnote on the log images. Um, you will only get the log images for the logs that are included in the import. So um, as with the GPX format, GC Live is only giving you um, some number of current logs. And those are the ones that it will tell uh, the uh, app about, and of course Geosphere will list them. But if there are 100 log images that go way back in time, you're only going to get the most recent ones unless you load the log. Right, that makes sense. Um, if you're in a situation where you're caching and uh, you know, you've exhausted hints, you've looked at images, you're still struggling to find it. Um, there is a way to force Geosphere to load all the log images, all the past ones. Keep in mind, it's all, already loading the, the cache images. It's the log images are the ones that doesn't know about them all. If you go into the image gallery and use the action button there, there's another update button. And doing the update from that place, so while viewing the list of images, it will go and get the entire image gallery list. And then you can look at the, the captions to decide which ones you want to pull in or, or all of them. 
Oh, okay. You can decide after you do that. I can see that could that could take a lot of time and a lot of data. It can be. So you got to be careful which cache. So so doing the update there isn't getting the image. It's just getting the list of images. Gotcha. Okay. Now, one of the other things that we've run into is the people who are trying to do the caching off the grid, as it were, uh, you know, where they're not in data service or using something like uh, an iPod or an iPad that might not even have uh, the GPS and data connection to begin with, but just using it for reference. And I understand that there is a way to actually save the satellite images so that you can use them without a uh, data connection to help you find those uh, caches. Uh, there is a bookmark already that will, uh, it's under system bookmarks, it's a show satellite image. And if you go ahead and uh, put that one, if you, if you want to use it a lot, um, as part of the bookmarks that show up when you're viewing a cache, uh, when you select that, it, it will bring up in the, in the browser a Google satellite image of where the cache is. Um, and any image that appears in the browser, again, that action button up in the corner gives you all the options allows you to save it to the cache. Nice. And I appreciate that it's a Google map image. Thank you. <laughs> yes, no problem there. <laughs> it's, it's no surprise that, that um, expanding the map options is what people are, are looking for. And mm -hmm. so uh, I have no hesitation in letting people know that uh, uh, Google Maps is indeed coming to Geosphere. Excellent. So I take it uh, you will then be using the new iOS uh, Google Maps API. Uh, that's correct. It only came out a couple of weeks before Geosphere 3 was released, so it was um, you know, way too close to the release date to want to make big changes. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't, I don't think it came out much more than a week ahead of time, but yeah, that was one of those, oh, bad timing. <laughs> Although I have to admit, I, I would have been a little bit... Uh, uh, happier having, or uh, as we did, getting uh, Geosphere 3 out the door and being able to mm -hmm. use it and still dealing with the uh, Apple Map, which I have to say have improved dramatically in the last uh, six months. Um, right. Indeed they have. And, and, and part of n now putting a, a second set of maps uh, and eventually more down the road after that um, is just making sure the internal architecture makes it easy for you to switch between maps and keep a consistent look because each map API, you know, has its own way of doing things. And with Geosphere, I'm trying to make things look consistent. Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but why don't we actually move on to some of the uh, tricks that people are going to uh, want to uh, learn and use. And uh, we'll start with uh, uh, viewing a cache from the search results. Um, yeah, excellent. There's a whole bunch of, of, of tricks or shortcuts, if you will, that if you don't mind, I'll just kind of go through a, a short list and, um, of things you can do. So if you're, if you're viewing the details of a cache, um, anywhere on the top area, that's the area above the description, you can swipe left and right if you would like to um, look for the next cache on the list. So you, let's say you're in the list, you pick the first cache, and you look at it and go, nope, not that one. You can just simply swipe towards the left and now look at the next cache. And, and vice versa, you can go previous as well. So um, that's a swipe operation. Um, if you were to double click on the cache icon, and this applies anywhere you see a cache icon, it will make that cache the target. Um, oh, I like a shortcut. that. Um, and, and as you may know, there's a setting that you can decide whether you want to immediately go look to, to, to navigate toward it or whether you want to make it the target but stay where you are. So that's a Think, uh, things you can change in settings. But back to the, the, the shortcuts, if you double click on the cache coordinate, then that will put you right into uh, the editor for the coordinate. So from there, you can change the coordinate, you can project a coordinate, you can copy and paste it you know, right there in the coordinate editor. If you double click to the right of that over where it says size difficulty terrain, that allows you to edit uh, virtually any parameter of the cache. Uh, if there's some reason you want to change it, uh, perhaps it's one that you entered yourself and you just want to, to adjust a few settings. Um, and, and if you move up, if you double click anywhere along the title across where you see the GC number or the cache name, that will send you down to the list of bookmarks at the bottom of the page. So it's a quick way to jump down if you have your favorite bookmarks down there. And let's see, the last one I can point out on this page um, is now you're down on the list. 
any list, if you click in the status bar, that's the black bar at the top with the time in it, a single click, that will scroll back to the top of the list. And that's actually an iOS feature, so that works throughout the app. Anytime you find yourself deep on a list and you want to go to the top, just touch the status bar. Great tips. Now, um, when you edit the coordinates, does I assume it just edits it for what's in Geosphere at the moment? Um, it, does it save it as the, uh, oh, I'm coming up with the words, the edited coordinates on geocaching.com? Yeah, the user waypoint. User um, waypoint. Thank you. Right. Currently, Geosphere does not upload that information um, to, to gc.com. It does always keep the original published coordinate. So if you, if you make a change and you're like, oops, I want to go back for any reason, you just go back to the coordinate editor, and you'll see at the bottom the original published location. You can select it and go back there. Um, or you can create a, a related waypoint or you know, another waypoint, if you will. Um, the changes you make on geocaching.com do reflect into Geosphere. So if you change the coordinates on the website and then import that cache, it will indeed show up as, a, uh, as an edited coordinate. Very good. Good information. And you do have an option uh, in the settings that if you've added uh, the final coordinates and stuff, it won't be replaced. So good reason to not necessarily delete the cache before you've gone and done the update if you haven't found it yet. Oh, right. Definitely. Good point. All kinds of stuff. But one of my favorite features is the field note templates. And this is what, to me, really makes this such a great tool for power caching, is you can go in and set up these cool templates that one tap and you do the whole thing. I have all kinds of cool templates set up uh, where... I'm using uh, URLs uh, for who I am caching with, links to the uh, uh, event for the day, and I'll go and set these up for an event if it's going to be a big caching event and say, hey, I found this cache with my friends and link to their profile while we were doing this event and link to the event. But then I can use these uh, uh, tags, and I'm really just using the basic tags right now. Can you share with us uh, what those are and maybe even get into uh, some of the uh, cooler functionality that is uh, now available? Uh, certainly. Uh, yeah, tags are uh, really placeholders. So Geosphere will take these, these things called tags, which are always enclosed in square brackets and use uppercase text. Um, and, for example, there's one where you put the word date in square brackets. Um, and it will replace that with the current date. Um, and as you are pointing out, some of these are, are, are basic. Many of them have advanced, um, you know, advanced features you can kind of add to it. For example, date, you are allowed to, to pick the format of the date. You can use your local formatting of the date, all kinds of options. Um, another one would be find count. So this is uh, the counter in Geosphere that's keeping track of how many uh, finds you've made. Um, it updates with GC Live, um, and then every time you, you, you create a found field node, it increments it, so it's trying to, uh, to show you where you are right now, even if you have not published your field notes. And, uh, and a variant of that one is find count today. So it uses the date to start the counter over again. And you can use these in your template it, to sort of customize the text. So you can say, you know, this is my find number from the beginning of time, or you could simply say, you know, my, my first one today. Um, you also asked about customizing. Um, there's a whole slew of, of tags. I'll, I'll highlight one. It's the replace tag. Um, and from the, you know, via podcast, it's, it's, you know, I'm not going to get into the delimiters and all the fine points, but the essence of it is um, tags can embed other tags. So replace is designed to look at whatever text you would like and search for specific values and then replace them with something else. So an example I kind of typed up real quick is if you wanted to um, change the text for your first find of the day, um, you could tell the replace to look at your find count today, and if it sees a one, put in first find of the day, and uh, otherwise have find number and then put a number in there of the day. And that's just a simple example of um, how you can customize so that 
uh, your text templates. You don't have to have two, um, hundreds of different text templates. You can have fewer number, but get as fancy as you want. Yeah, or go back and manually enter, or manually edit them, which is what I've been doing. And that's one of the great things about this, too, is when you hit that template, you can still go in and drop in your notes because it's evaluating the uh, uh, data right when you're in that uh, uh, field. You can, you know, hit that button, it fills all that information in, and you can edit and put in any notes, you know, like, hey, this cache was wet and could use some maintenance, or hey, great cache. So it's not the copy and paste logs with a little bit of intelligence. You can actually get a lot more involved, even though you are using these uh, templates. Yeah, and you can apply more than one to a cache. You can, you can break it down to, you know, this is what I want to say at the beginning, and on certain caches, I'll apply another template at the end to say something different, for example. Sure, yeah, and it, all kinds of great power in using those templates, and you can tweak them to be uh, exactly what you want. Exactly, and so I'd, I would encourage the listeners that, that you know, are excited about getting into this to, um, you know, look at the online documentation or go to the forum. Um, there are a lot more tags available for both these field notes as well as um, if you want to create custom bookmarks. Yeah, we'll link to the uh, Geosphere documentation that includes the basic tag so people can get started. But really, the forums are probably the best place, uh, as I understand it, to get more information about how to really put those uh, tags to use. Exactly. What I like when people ask a question on the forum is uh, we get to answer it, and now it's available for everybody else to see and learn from that. Yeah, always a nice uh, functionality, uh, you know, especially with uh, searching. You can find that stuff pretty easily. But one of the things that I want to uh, kind of go back to a little bit, we touched on before, and I really think is awesome for things like those uh, uh, caches that you want to do on a trip or if you're doing a power uh, caching run is highlighting caches. And that did change the way that it works a little bit in this version and kind of threw me for a loop. So let's start off by talking about what the uh, highlight does and then go into how it uh, actually happens in the current version. Okay. Um, well, highlighting is merely uh, you're trying to make the cache stand out. So if you're looking in list form, it takes entire background of that cache uh, and, and changes it to an orange color so as you're scrolling through the list it stands out. And in the map it gives it um, kind of an orange halo so you can still see the pin or any characteristics that, that would normally be displayed by the pin um, but on top of that you can see that it's highlighted or it stands out. If, yeah. So if that's what you meant. Yeah, and it also does allow you to do a filter so you can just pop back in and do the filter for uh, highlighted only. So if you're you know, if you're going to be on a, a, a driving trip and you say, okay, these are the ones I de definitely want to hit, you can highlight them and only show those. But if you're saying, okay, I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, is there another cache around here? You can turn them back on and see all of those caches. And that's one of the things that really made that uh, valuable to me. Yeah, and then there's two ways of thinking. To be fair, when we talk about highlight, we should also mention the ignore because it, it kind of is the opposite function where you might look at a cache and say, no, I don't think I'm going to do this one. And you can, you can choose to associate it with ignore. And then if you're filtering out all the ignored caches, then, um, then you won't see it on the list. Um, so you have the choice of making something stand out or removing it from the list, whichever way you like. Right, and as I understand it, uh, both of those functions, I know the highlight function is because I just went and used that today, uh, is available from that uh, menu in the uh, uh, right corner as you're viewing the cache. Uh, co correct. You're viewing the cache, you hit the action button in the upper right. Um, you know, that action button, that, that's an awful lot like the right mouse click of a computer. Um, so whatever is being displayed on the screen, is what, it shows you what can be done. And right there, you'll see highlight and ignore. Yeah, that, that is a really very useful function that I absolutely love and has made my uh, uh, trip so much easier because I don't have to sit at the computer and plan out and do the list. I can actually sit you know, with the uh, uh, iPhone or whatever at uh, uh, the hotel room, and it, it really has allowed me to do uh, more better caching without having to carry around a laptop. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you don't have to individually highlight them. I mean, if you can set up a filtering criteria that pulls out the ones you're interested in, then via the caches uh, online or offline, you're looking at your list. Again, the action button up upper right will give you the option to highlight all the caches in that list. Right, right, and we uh, kind of talked about ways that you can do, you know, the bookmark highlights, the uh, caches, and that kind of stuff. So there's all kinds of ways to make use of that, and I really find that to be a great way to uh, work when I'm on the road, especially. And for power caching trips, it's really nice. You can power, you know, you highlight all of the uh, power trail caches, and then leave the ones that are not power trail caches in the list but they're not highlighted. So if you're running a little behind, you can skip over those caches and only hit the ones mm-hmm. in that series. Exactly, exactly. And that's what's new with 3.0 is, especially in a map view, um, it doesn't take a dedicated pin color. So you can still see the pin color for, for the Geo3 users know. It, it tells you the type of cache. And in version 2, uh, highlighting was a new pin color, so you couldn't tell anymore. Was that a multi or a traditional? And version 3, highlighting does not take away from any other attribute you can tell on the map. Yeah, which is a huge, huge improvement that really uh, makes that uh, feature so much more valuable. Well, for me, Geosphere 3 does a lot of what I was doing in GSEC. So really, I can do all this on the go now, as Daryl said, not needing that laptop in front of me. Yeah, and with the uh, live API, now you don't have to even uh, set up a pocket query a lot of the time. You can just do your searches uh, right there. And actually, that's probably a good point uh, that we haven't really touched on, is how to do a search for a given location without going and creating your pocket query or being in that area. Uh, right. You can use, you go to caches online, um, use the map, and you can move the map either by scrolling it or one of the options is you can enter an address or a zip code or wh- whatever you'd like. Um, uh, and it will uh, center the map on that area, and then you can do a new search based on the map. So this is what I do when I'm out and I hadn't planned on a certain area and I have extra time. Um, I'll just move the map to that area and say grab the caches in this area. I might scroll the map over and say do another one in case I go a little farther. Um, Knowing that, and this is a key point, every time you do an online search, Geosphere is automatically saving that into a group that's available offline. So you can at any point you want switch over to caches offline um, and access all of those caches that you, you had just pulled in. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, groups, and we've talked about it a few times before, which really do throw a lot of uh, newer users for a loop, and I'd love to go into that uh, more because it's another great feature, but I think we'll save that for uh, another time since we are uh, getting a little bit uh, long and have so much good information we've already thrown in there. So, Mark, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Is there anything you can uh, uh, give our listeners before we uh, take off to help them... uh, Uh, find out more beyond what we've talked about here? Um, I would mostly encourage uh, the forum. That's the place to go to look where people have asked questions, to ask new questions, and as I said earlier, questions that are asked there, everybody gets the benefit from the answers. So I would encourage people to to go over there, create an account, ask your questions, um, and I'll be glad to help you out. Excellent. And we'll, of course, link to... uh, uh, your site, the forum, and to the uh, documentation so people can get uh, started with the uh, tags and stuff uh, right in the show notes, so check those out. And everyone else, uh, remember that uh, uh, next week we're talking about uh, uh, scuba caching caching. with uh, clay jar, then we're on to uh, streaking, and then we have that uh, randomized edition, which I always love because we have a whole bunch of great topics Uh, Most of them uh, submitted from our uh, listeners, and it's been a while, so it should be a really good, uh, probably a little bit long show. Well, I think we'll have some great content to pull from for that show. Check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206 350 3647 by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. 
Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. This show's copyright 2013 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Thank you.